Section 8, we're looking at Noah's faith and how that is supposed to impact, and we're taking our second look at that. Our focus is we should strive to make our faith work properly as much as our most prized tools and technology. So even though Noah didn't know about our tools and technology, he did know about tools and technology because he built an ark. So uh, people are still trying to figure out how he did it. But uh, obviously, we know how to take care of the things that we use on a daily basis. Our faith should be the ultimate thing that we use. And so we want to guard that. I'm looking ahead from Hebrews 11 to the first verse that follows this chapter on all these people who live by faith. So Hebrews 12 verse 1 starts, therefore. And what that says is, as we go through all these examples of people who live by faith, there's an expectation you're going to do something with it, right? Okay, I've shown you all these people who live by faith. Therefore, what should you do with it? And I want to introduce you to that so that in the months it's going to take for us to get through that chapter 11, you will be think of, thinking of this the whole time, that God actually expects Noah's faith to encourage you in your faith. So he's not just some encouragement from the past, he's actually an encouragement for the present to live in our day. And so the therefore is the expectation we are going to learn from their faith and essentially do the same kinds of things. Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that is a summary of Hebrews 11. By faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Moses, all of those are saying, okay, now that you've seen all those, those people are a great cloud of witnesses. They're surrounding you. It's like, a cloud that has come around you as you are walking the life of faith. You are surrounded by people who have lived by faith. So therefore, since you are surrounded right now with this great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight. The also means just like them. They had to throw aside the things that would have kept them from their assignment. They weren't necessarily bad things, but they would have kept them from their assignment. So we're to also lay aside things that we can't necessarily say they're wrong, but you can't do your assignment and keep doing those things as well. So lay aside those things and sin which clings so closely. And the and is let us also lay aside sin which clings so closely. So just like they had to get rid of sin in their lives to join God in what he was doing, we have to do the same thing. And that great cloud of witnesses is to encourage us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. So all those people of faith ran with endurance the race that was set before them. Okay? So Noah had a race. He, in a sense, was racing against time to build an ark in order to save his family and a representation of all the animals. He had to run that race with endurance to make sure that he was in time with God's plan. He had to get rid of things that weren't bad in themselves, but he didn't have time for them if he was going to save his family and these animals. And so... I want us to have that in mind as we continue looking at Noah, that God actually, he's presenting Noah as one more of these witnesses, and he's witnessing to you as you go to school, or you go to work, or you go with friends, or whatever you're doing, and he's constantly saying, by faith, the righteous shall live by faith. And so that's what his encouragement is. So we're going to strive with Noah's example to make our faith work properly like his did as much as we take care of our prized tools and technology. So back uh, uh, Hebrews 11 verse 7. By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Now, 
what did by faith Noah actually look like? So we're going to go back into Genesis where we're given the historical record of Noah's life. And we're going to think about what did his faith look like in the world he lived in, in the assignment that he had, in the, you know, the quality uh, of life, the relationships that we saw were all his family members. How did he actually do that? Because that will help us think about situations we are in. And just in case some of us think, Noah doesn't, he didn't really have to deal with the stuff we do. By going and looking at the world in which he lived by faith, I think we will see that we are in the same kind of world. Therefore, we can live the same kind of faith. God's not calling us to more than what Noah was called to do. So, in Genesis 5 starting at verse 1. This is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them and named them man when they were created. Now, I want to go through this and consider why is this whole section leading up to Noah introduced like this. So Noah is the end of this book of the generations of Adam, or at least this introductory section. It goes from Adam to Noah. So there are some things about that that you and I have to think about. The, the view of life, the history of humanity, it comes from this book of the generations of Adam. And if your understanding of human history doesn't go back to this, then you're following the wrong history. So, when we look at the generations of Adam, you go back to Adam, you're going back to when God created man. And I, I'm trying to show this to think about how evil the world was in ten generations. And God's introducing that by saying it's all about the generations of Adam, and it's about God creating man. That's what decides what is good or bad in life. He made him in the likeness of God. So man was created in the likeness of God. That's an essential part of understanding who we are. Male and female, he created them. So notice uh, it's God created man, he made him. So man as him is just humanity. But male and female, he created them. So among the them of humanity is male and female. And blessed them and named them man when they were created. How much of the sin in the world is because man denies the book? So you think of the sin in the world, and people are constantly saying, the book isn't true. The book of the history of man from Adam, we don't believe it. And then you look at how sinful the world is, because they aren't willing to accept that the book has told us who we are. They do not want that. They throw off the restraint that comes from saying, there's a book that tells us who we are. If we don't want to be that... Why would you want a book always telling you that you're not living up to what you should be like? So throw away the book, and then you don't have to keep seeing that you're different than that. Man denies that God created man. This is such an amazing thing that our public schools are inundated with the teaching that God did not create man. That's the only reason for the theory of evolution. You have to explain life without this. It's not scientific, it's not even reasonable, <laughs> but they have to come up with something. They deny that God created man, hence man thinks they're free to do whatever they want. Man denies that we are made in the likeness of God. Again, as soon as you say we're in the likeness of God, that means there's a measure of what it means to be man, to be a human being. And man throws that off. Man denies that we are male and female. I don't know, in my early couple of decades, I didn't even know that this would have been a question. 
that people would argue about, that we are male and female. I had no idea that male and male and female and female stuff even existed at the time. And now in our day where they're saying that we can't even know if a male is a male or a female is a female, it's like all they're doing is denying that God created us male and female. And a lot of the sin is because they just simply deny that God has a right to say that he did that. Man denies that our name is man. Now, we're living in a culture that wants us to think there's something wrong with saying we are men. We have a prime minister who gets very offended if you say mankind. This is part of our heritage, people. We cannot accommodate the world and stop saying we are men. We are men. That's what he called us. That's what the creator says. So don't treat it like a simple thing that, oh, you know, we just shouldn't offend people. It's okay to change. It's like, no, that's the name God gave to us. It's our heritage. It's who we are. You cannot understand what it means to be a human being without saying God called the corporate full humanity man. Not men and women, just we're man. All of us are. And man denies our history from Adam. Even in Christian circles, there's a whole movement to deny uh, that, that history is the way Genesis describes it. And they're taking all the evidence that shows Noah's flood in geology and saying, no, that goes before Adam. Somewhere, all that death and suffering happened before God created Adam. There were hominids, you know, Neanderthals, that kind of thing, before Adam. And they're actually denying the history that's in the book, that everything starts with Adam. So, I just want that in focus, because we've already looked at how evil and wicked the world was at that time. But think about it in our world, how the world denies everything that God says about who we are, how we relate to him. And then what is evil and wicked in our world is because we have thrown off our creator. Now, what are the issues of faith in this? First of all, Christians affirm the book. And you might meet Christians that don't affirm the book. They don't affirm the Bible. They don't affirm the, the book of Genesis. Do you know that all our major doctrines come out of Genesis 1 to 11? Why is there salvation? Because man sinned. They ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why are there so many different ethnic groups? Not races. There's only one human race. Why are they all here? Well, the Tower of Babel explains why there's so many different languages spread out throughout the world. You have to understand, like as Christians, we're never going to get away from affirming the book, including the whole Bible, but particularly the book of Genesis that gives us the first picture of our history. We affirm that God created man. Our understanding of ourselves comes from the fact that we are created by God. We affirm that we're made in the likeness of God. We lost that in the sense where we sinned, but the whole plan of salvation is for God to get back a people that he can restore to the image and likeness of his son. What happens when Jesus comes? We shall be like him. That's what the plan is. Why are we saved? So we can become like Jesus once again. So you can't understand sin, which is, it's different than Jesus. You can't understand righteousness. It's just like Jesus. Without understanding, we're made to be in the likeness of our Savior. We affirm that we are male and female. And I don't know in my lifetime, how much trouble we might get in just for saying, no, boys are boys and girls are girls. There's only male and female. And Jesus restores anybody who's confused about that. He will fix anybody who is feeling broken in their maleness or their femaleness. He will restore those aspects of being in the likeness of God. There's something about being male and being female that are part of us being in the image and likeness of God. So if it's broken, we don't tell people they can be different. We tell people Jesus will set you free. He will restore you to what he has designed. We affirm that our name is man. So I'm never going to start 
calling us something different. We are not people kind, we are mankind, because that's the name God gave us. And we affirm that our history comes from Adam. How do you make sense of, of the New Testament talking about a second Adam if you don't go back to the first Adam? The first Adam brought sin into the world. The second Adam brought righteousness into the world. The first Adam brought sin on humanity. The second Adam took humanity's sin on himself. So you have to understand that we go back to these things. And I, I might be elaborating it more than you think I need to, but I read so many articles where in Christian circles this stuff is being discarded. People think, oh, science proved we evolved, so this couldn't be true. It's like, that's hogwash. There's no proof of evolution. It's impossible to have happened. <laughs> but this is all true. So, then we jump ahead to Genesis 6, verse 5. So, uh, Genesis 5 goes through the whole book of Adam from Adam to Noah. And now we're introduced to Noah's time. The Lord saw, or Yahweh saw, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And what I want you to think about is when we're told in Hebrews, by faith Noah, we have to keep in mind, by faith Noah obeyed and followed God in a world that was full of wickedness where every intention of the thoughts of the heart of man was evil continually. So if you think you're in a setting where people just seem so evil that you can't live by faith, Noah would be in that great cloud of witnesses saying, Hello there! <laughs> my parents, my uncles and aunts, my cousins were the evil people that brought the flood on the earth. I know what it's like to live among evil people. But by faith, you listen to what God's saying, you watch what he's doing, and you join him in his work. Every Christian can learn from this example. Now, the intention of the thoughts of the heart is like an inclination, a disposition. So, you could expect, for, for uh, Noah, as he watched his family, whatever they were doing, you could expect that if they sat down to talk, it would automatically go in the direction of evil. That's the way they were inclined. And we struggle with that a bit in our North American culture that used to have a little bit of a sense of being Christianized. To watch people become more and more evil, to celebrate it as we're seeing all around us. And, and Noah's time, the intentions their actual intentions. They weren't accidentally doing evil things. It's what they wanted to do all the time. And that's the world that Noah uh, lived in. And the emphasis is every intention was only evil continually. Like you can't think of an environment that is more evil than that. In our day, even though there is this, there's still the church. There still are a lot of Christians who love Jesus and are living for him and are praying for the world and wanting people to get saved. Noah didn't have people like that. So in this world, he was able to live by faith, and it was all because of his attachment to God. We have the wickedness of expression. So in other words, what people do. So the wickedness of man was great in the earth. In other words, their actions, the, the actions of wickedness, expressing wickedness filled the earth. And it comes from the evil of the heart, where every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And I just say that because you don't see people doing wicked things out of good hearts. When you see people claiming to be supporting some good cause and yet their hearts are their their expressions are full of hatred and intolerance and anger and and all these ungodly things it's like but that's what's in their heart no matter what they say is a good cause if what comes out of them is wicked it's because their heart is evil and we can't escape that that's why god always gives deals with the heart he gives us a new heart because it has to start there 
Now, I want to think through the issues of faith, because what I want you doing all through this is putting yourself in the picture to think, so why would that be an example for me? So think of the issues of faith that this forces each of us to deal with. Romans 3, 22 and 23 says, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This is an issue of faith because we all work with non-Christians. They're all around us. The description of humanity at Noah's time, we might be inclined to think, and there are, like right now in churches, they are, are taking away certain sins, because they're saying, but we know these people, and they're really nice people. Until we deal with this as an issue of faith, every human being, except for Jesus Christ when he was here in the flesh, every human being has sinned and has fallen short of the glory of God. You will not meet one human being who, of whom this isn't true. You will not have one non-Christian friend so good that this isn't true about them. This has been true since Adam. That's why we need the book to tell us our problem goes back to Adam. And then Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. What did God tell Adam would happen if they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? You will die. And of course, they didn't die physically right away. But death came into the world. We have to understand this. All our non-Christian friends, acquaintances, neighbors, family members are sinners. And they're all under the sentence of death. Which includes the wrath of God that's going to come. We have to treat that like an issue of faith. When I look at my neighborhood, when I look at my friends, my family... I have to look at them as sinners who are under condemnation. That's part of what moves us to be different from them is because if we don't build the art to save people, they're not going to. If we don't share our faith with people, how do we know anybody else will? We have to see them as sinners under the sentence of death. And that will move us in how we share with them. So Genesis 6, as, as it continues, And Yahweh regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Did you know God has a heart? We are in his image. Now our hearts are corrupt, but our heart is designed after his heart. Our mind is designed after his mind. We have the mind of Christ. So our mind is in that likeness of what God's mind is like. And so God regretted. He was feeling regret and grief. Regret means to be caused to feel sorrow. So that, in a sense, came upon him because of all the wickedness and evil he saw in man that he had created. He had created these people to be like him. And he had to watch their wickedness and evil, and that the only thing they intended to do. You know, some people say, why did God wipe out whole nations, including women and children? It's like, because he saw in their hearts they were all intending to do evil. Why, you know, you think those people, they're just inclined to evil. They're never going to be different. And so in the midst of that, God regretted. He just felt sorrow that he had done that. He's not rethinking it. He's not saying, I shouldn't have done it. He's feeling sorrow that what he created to be like him had turned out so wicked and evil. Grieve means to cause to feel sorrow. And these are actually different words in the Hebrew, and it's just speaking in synonyms for emphasis. It's, it's using similar phrases to get the same point across. God was brokenhearted at what he saw because he knew what he had made. I, I, I'm thinking of something where, you know, maybe we design some amazing vehicle or something and it's designed for safety and fuel economy and everything. 
and then somebody takes it and next thing we know it's a pile of junk because they drive it up in the hills and do jumps with it and and it's just being destroyed well god created us and that's why that emphasis on 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 the whole picture is start with the fact that we go back to adam we go back to creation we're in his image we're male and female in his image and he's watching everything about man turn to wickedness and god wants us to know how he feels about it okay and so you've got his heart versus the evil of man's heart and that's an issue of faith when you look at the people around you put yourself in noah's place where everybody was related to him and he had to choose between what was in their hearts and what was in god's heart like do you think about what's in the heart of the people you work with or friends or or neighbors or whoever like if their heart is evil continually and God has a different heart, whose heart is going to move you? So we're shown man's heart, now we're shown God's heart. The issues of faith, caring about God's heart instead of man's heart. When we're afraid to share our faith, it's almost like, well, can you guess whose heart we're concerned about? Ours, that's it. It's how it will affect me. It's all I'm, care all I'm concerned about. I don't really admit to myself what their heart is like because I can't really live with that. I can't really live with how evil they are and that they're lost and they're under judgment of sin. And I can't keep paying attention to God's heart if I don't want to tell anybody about him because <laughs> that would overwhelm me. And so everything just settles into my heart, how I feel. And I just want us to see it's an issue of faith whether we're affected by our heart the hearts of the evil people around us or God's heart and God's heart of course is calling us to be the light to those people Ephesians 4 verse 30 says and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption this is in there if you go back to Noah we see that God was grieved so when we're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit, it would be because the church is doing things contrary to what God is like. Right? So God looks down on humanity and he's grieved by how wicked and evil they are and that what's in their hearts is an intention to do evil. And we're told, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Grieving the Spirit would be that he is working to make us like Jesus, and we're doing things to be like the world. And when we, when we realize that the church has a personal relationship to the Holy Spirit, who is presently working to make us like Jesus, and there's things we do, and he's looking at us like, why are you watching that? Why are you reading that? Why are you with those people? Why are you wishing... You could be like them like he sees it all and he would be grieved if what is in our heart is a desire to be like worldlings rather than to be like Jesus and so I'm just putting that there that like we need to let God's heart affect us and that he, he does have a heart that feels grief the Holy Spirit is a person He's watching us. He's working in us. He's between us and the Father so that whatever's on the mind of the Father, the Holy Spirit comes to us. You can almost think of him being excited with what the Father has in mind for us. And then he looks in our hearts. And if we have no desire for that, it would grieve him because he knows what the Father could have done today. You know? Remember G Jesus says he was... Uh, looking over Jerusalem and he wept over Jerusalem because he said how long have I wanted to to gather you to myself as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you weren't willing and Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem the spirit is grieved 
God is grieved. And that's a faith issue. Do I attach to God as a God who gets grieved when we prefer being like the world rather than like Jesus? So Genesis 6, verse 7, So Yahweh said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. Now, I will blot out man. I don't know. There's some stains that get on a fabric that if you blot them, you can take them out. Uh, an ink spill can be blotted up so that it's removed. Uh, God's using that idea of, okay, there's something there. I'm just going to blot it up until it ceases to exist. You know, humanity is a stain on the planet, so I'm going to blot them up. I'm going to blot them out so the stain is gone. And, of course, a worldwide flood would do it. So just think of that, that God was working to get rid of the stain on his planet, the stain in humanity, because it was grieving him to see such a mess. Again, whom I have created... What that says is God, is, God has the right to execute justice because we are his. The whole thing is his. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You cannot go out from what is his. So when he's coming to blot out man, he's coming to carry out justice on his creation. He's not coming to some place that isn't his, and he's going to be mean to the people who live there. He created us, and he has every right to carry out justice. And, and as we know through the scriptures, he's always slow to get angry. He's always patient beyond measure before he ever acts. And even this is, you know, 100 years or more before the flood. He's, he's going to give them lots of time. But again, I'm sorry that I've made them. Just another synonym of being grieved, caused to feel sorrow. Now, this might be as far as we get. But I want to show you this part. Because when we come on Noah, Noah isn't the first person to affect the world with a message of about the ungodliness of these people. And now that I've been able to look at it on a timeline, it's quite fascinating. So I found this new one. Enoch is right here, okay? So he's the seventh from Adam. Noah is the tenth from Adam. And what I want you to see is, if you just hear the genealogy, it's almost like, okay, Adam came and went, uh, Seth came and went, Enoch came and went. And you don't realize, no, they didn't come and go. They overlapped a lot. So, Enoch, in his life spy, lifetime, was with nine generations. All nine generations before Noah. So it wasn't, he was the seventh, and then he was gone. And then Methuselah and Lamech came with no connections. Like, no, Enoch was... Methuselah's dad, he was Lamech's grandfather, and they overlapped. And the reason I'm showing that is because when Noah comes in, Enoch already had opportunity to affect all those previous generations before Noah. Okay? Which I'm saying this because it really multiplies the guilt when we realize that Enoch already gave these people an opportunity to turn from their sin, okay? So there's Enoch in the middle of all that, touching all nine of those generations. And this is in Jude 1, verse 14. It was also said about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones, to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. 
So we know when the Enoch lived, right? Enoch was saying this in his generation. All nine of those generations prior to Noah would have heard this, or at least had the potential to have heard this. They were all his family. Right? So, all the ungodly, of all their deeds of ungodliness, committed in such an ungodly way, all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him, that was Enoch's message to his family. And it kind of, I think it kind of shows that, that his son Methuselah and his grandson Lamech didn't listen to this message. Because it didn't impact things when Noah came along. <laughs> Noah was living in a world that was wicked and evil. Okay? So, I just want us to see this, that Enoch had already preached to his family prior to God saying that this earth is so full of wicked people, I'm going to blot them out. That shows that God doesn't show up suddenly and just say, guys, I've had enough, bang. He always tells people what he's going to do. Enoch had already warned the people about their ungodliness, and it didn't affect them one little bit. So when Noah came, and then God gave them a hundred or more years to still get ready, and however long it took to build the ark, it was giving them time to see that, that God was going to bring judgment on their ungodliness, and nobody repented, because the evil, it's like in John 1, it says that people love darkness because their deeds are evil. That's why when you look at, at the world today, they love darkness. They love it. They love secrecy. They love dishonesty. They love hiding things. They love, you know, the, the dishonesty we're seeing around us because their deeds are evil and they don't want them coming into the light. And so I hope you can see that sounds so familiar to us. Like, has this generation of the world had people preach the gospel to them? Of course they have. All over the place. And it's being rejected because every intention of the thoughts of their hearts is evil continually. <laughs> Still the same. Can you live by faith? Absolutely. Because God is still here. And now, in a sense, we have more reason or more substance because we've got the gospel. Moses preached righteousness and told them there's salvation in an ark. But we have a gospel that is preached throughout the world. It's the only hope of the world before the wrath of God comes against this planet. And we have to look at this and say, if, if Noah was called to build an ark to bring salvation, you and I have already been given the salvation it's almost like the ark is built. We don't even have to build it. We just have to tell people where it is. There's a door. Jesus is the door. We just have to tell them that. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We don't have to even take time to build an ark. And so we have to think our world is just as evil as Noah's day. If, if the church was removed right this minute, and all that was left was the world, it would be just as evil as, as Noah's day. But the church is here because we are the ones who can preach the good news and tell people there's a door, there's a way, there's a truth, there's a life. Come to Jesus. So, if any part of this is kind of resonating with us, that, that you feel disconnected from that kind of faith, then let's deal with your faith. Because... If we have the faith, period, it's the same faith as Noah, Moses, Abraham, all of them. If we have faith, then we can live in the righteousness that we are given in Christ. We can be a light shining in this dark place, and we can be a church that brings people to set salvation in Christ because that's what his intention is. The only reason we're still here is because there's more lost sheep to find and to bring into salvation. And so by faith, we have to be able to do that.
Amen.